So, okay, some of you guys know that I have a PhD in sociology, and some of you know that I'm also a woo-woo person who believes, has always believed, that sometime in my lifetime I would experience a global transformation of human consciousness. I don't know why I always believed that. I just always believed it, and that's part of why I studied sociology. So, what I am is somebody who has woo-woo ideas and tries to test them scientifically. And I believe that we may be on the brink of, some authors have called it a kind of epidemic of awakening, that individuals may actually come into a state that is more enlightened and therefore create a better society than we've ever seen before. That is not what seems to be happening, if you have checked the news at all. It kind of seems to be going the other way, but very often, it is at the extreme of one system that another system comes in. Like in Confucianist China, which was very rigid, you got the Taoists coming in to talk about a way of thinking that was incredibly fluid. So sometimes when you, it's like shooting an arrow, when you pull way back in one direction, it shoots things forward in an opposite direction. So here's what I think is going to happen, and it pertains to you, so please listen. The way our society is structured right now is like a pyramid. Here is a pyramid that I made myself out of sugar cubes. And it represents the, the power structures that come from the ability to force, to amass wealth, to kill, to harm, to dominate. And this is the type of social structure that's been in existence all over the world for recorded history, okay? The, the more powerful, brutal, violent people take all the stuff, they get to the top, they get power, wealth, and status, and the people at the bottom end up growing the grain to feed the monarchs and they starve and they're miserable. And every society has pretty much been that way. Powerful elite at the top, miserable working poor at the bottom. And the sad thing is that when you go to revolution to overthrow it, which has happened all over the world in many places, many times, you get this awful thing where it just creates another pyramid. So when I was in China studying right after the Cultural Revolution, they used to have a joke. They'd say, you know, under capitalism, humans exploit other humans. But under communism, it's the other way around. <sighs> Not so great. Like the, the communists didn't do any better a job than the, than the landlords who came before them. So everybody has always known that there's something unfair and wrong about this, but everyone wants to get to the top. And right now we have a society of people who are desperately trying to get to the top, just like they always have. And it seems to me like it's getting weirder and more sordid and more awful. And I think a lot of you have been feeling that way. That's what I see on Facebook. That's what I see when I talk to people. So as a sociologist who believes in a transformation of consciousness, all my life I've been thinking, what would an enlightened society look like? Like if everyone was awake, what would it look like? What would the structure be? And what I came up with was it would be like this. It's, a, it's a, just a pool of water, yeah? I colored it blue for you. So everything is completely equal. And every person is represented not as by their place on the pyramid, but by a stream of energy that flows into the pool. And it creates that ring of concentric circles of waves that go out. So everybody has waves of energy that come out from them. And everyone's wave energy interacts. And sometimes like one uh, uh, high energy meets a low energy and they cancel each other out. Sometimes two waves meet and they create something called constructive interference where the goodness really goes beyond um, what either could accomplish on its own. So I thought, okay, this is it. It's a perfectly still flat pool and we're all energy flowing into it. And our impact has to do with how authentic we are, how much of ourselves, we, our real selves, we are putting into this pool of, of goodness. <laughs> and for a long time I had the two in my head and I thought, how do you turn a, a pyramid into a pool? How do you turn a pyramid into a pool? How do we turn this crazy, grubby, grimy, horrifying thing that is the power structure into something clean and clear and good? And then one day I realized all along, the pyramid has been in the pool. The pool has been forming around it. So here's what's happening, okay? You've got a group of people becoming enlightened and they're below everyone else. They're lower than the rest of the pyramid. 
They are not coming in and winning. But from the bottom up, they are slowly dissolving the power structure. And the people who dissolve first, who give up the old way of being first, are the ones who has the least to lose. So they're on the bottom. They, they just absorb the people around them because they are made of inclusion and love. There is no conquering in this. The, the pool doesn't destroy the pyramid, it includes it. And it makes it into something clear and fluid and sweet. And the people at the very top of the pyramid are the last ones to know what is going to happen. This will not be a revolution, this transformation. It will be a dissolution. It will be an inclusion. And how do we bring it about? We dissolve the rigid power structures, the fear-based, needy, hungry, violent parts of ourselves. We dissolve that into the sweetness. And we do it by reaching inward to the heart instead of obeying the ego. In Asia, they say the mind is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. And the heart is the master that the mind should be serving. How does the mind serve the heart? One word, art. Well, a number of ways, but art is the primary one. There are certain people who breathe in their own authenticity. They go inside, they dissolve the obstacles to their own clarity, their own illumination. And then they find a way after that inhale to breathe out their message, their light, um, their energy to more and more people. And the people around them start to dissolve and become more like that. That's what happened around Jesus. That's what happened around Buddha. That's what happened around Gandhi and Martin Luther King. It happens. It happens. Okay. So I know some people that I've talked to are really discouraged. It's like, why should we make art? Everything's falling apart. I want you to listen to a quote from Toni Morrison. She wrote this in a self-described very dark mood after George Bush the, the second was elected for the second time and she was feeling really down. And she wrote, this is precisely the time when artists go to work. There is no time for despair. There is no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language, that is how civilizations heal. And may I add, that is how civilizations become clear and equal and sweet and inclusive. So I'm trying to do it. I was talking to my friend Liz Gilbert about how we've always used language to go in and find our hearts and clear the space in ourselves. And it's like an inhale and then the exhale is how many, how many souls can we touch with sweetness, with kindness, with equality, with love? And um, we're doing a writing course on that. You can see it in the link under the video. And this is part of what it means. This is all of what it means for me to change the world right now. This is what came to me. What's coming to you? Breathe in. Find yourself. Find your truth. Become clear. And then watch all the rigidity in you dissolve. And then be that. And watch the people around you begin to lose their own rigidity and join you in this fluid oneness that is a transformed society. I hope this helps and uh, I'll see you on the internet.